I'm Raj Mirotra. I'm professor of medicine here at the University of Washington in Seattle and section head for nephrology at Harborview Medical Center. I was a member of the hemodialysis adequacy update for 2015. Clinical pra practice guidelines in general should be viewed um, as a roadmap and not a mandate for clinical practice. Uh, they synthesize the best evidence that's available out there that should be used in clinical practice but that does not take the place of clinical judgment and individualizing treatment for a patient. Um, and it, moving forward, it would be a mistake for this to be used then um, for judging performance of individual units and or physicians uh, in clinical practice. Shared decision-making essentially implies that there is room for the physician in soliciting and eliciting the values and expectations from dialysis treatment for an individual patient and tailor the therapy to that individual patient rather than using a one-size-fits-all in using a standardized prescription or approach in the care for all patients. The knowledge that we have about the practice of hemodialysis, as with any other area of medicine, um, increases incrementally over time. So if you were to look in broad strokes in how the guideline is today compared to the last update, the changes are relatively small uh, because all, most of the evidence that has accumulated since then has validated the guidelines the way they were written in 2006. There are a couple important things that are different that are important to highlight. Um, the first is there's greater emphasis on shared decision-making that gets back to the point uh, of the guideline being used as a roadmap rather than as a mandate. The second important thing is that a lot more data has have accumulated on the importance of frequent hemodialysis, its potential benefits and risks, and the guideline finally has uh, the data to back uh, clinical decisions to ensure that it, we use it appropriately for patients. And finally, there's an increased recognition and importance of volume management and blood pressure control. Uh, and this guideline makes significant uh, comments uh, on how that should be applied in clinical practice. Uh, so the chair of the work group were uh, Tom Deppner and John DeGirdas, internationally renowned experts in the field of hemodialysis adequacy. The members of the work group, along with I, were uh, Mike Rocco, Dan Wiener, Jula Inrig, and Rita Suri. In how the statements are um, graded, there is a number grade that is one or two, uh, and then there is a letter grade that goes from A through D. The number grade is how strongly we feel the, pra the practice should be. Um, and one is we recommend, two is we suggest. A through D is the strength of evidence with A being studies from randomized controlled clinical trials that have, have been replicated, and D is based upon limited data, largely observational, if not anecdotal. So putting that then in context is, um, for each statement that we have as a guideline statement, um, there, are, there are practice positions that we have taken that are not very well informed by the evidence that is out there to date and that is why they're ungraded. The, the intent of the guideline is to provide the best possible recommendation or suggestion based upon the evidence that is out there. There is accumulating evidence on the importance of reducing ultrafiltration rates on blood pressure control and improving volume status. However, the evidence is not strong enough for us to hold people um, to a certain target level for any one of these parameters. Hopefully, as our knowledge expands, we'll be able to get there uh, in future iterations of the guidelines. And how the guidelines were, were put together and updated was based upon the review of literature. And we recognize that there is a hierarchy of evidence in being the best evidence uh, being derived from more than one randomized controlled trials down to the level of controlled clinical trials, observational studies, and case series. Um, so it is in that context that at this time, with the new technologies that have become available, 
since the FHM clinical trials were completed, there are no randomized controlled clinical trials that would give us the confidence on making definitive statements with regards to what we think that the role of technology as it has evolved over time should be in the care of patients today. Uh, this provides a lot of flexibility to physicians uh, in uh, leveraging these technologies and makes room for new technologies as they become available um, without there being firm statements in the form of a guideline statement. Um, putting all of this together, getting back to the point that a big emphasis in this set of guidelines is on shared decision making and in what we know about these new technologies, as important as they are in how they have modified patients' lives, um, it builds on that theme on leaving flexibility and decision making by physicians for individual patients. It, it is a pleasure to work with this uh, accomplished group of individuals from around the country uh, to put together these guideline statements. We think it is a valuable tool um, and not a mandate in how patients should be cared for. Uh, and our hope is uh, that these guidelines would uh, be an important tool in care of patients with end-stage renal disease undergoing chemodialysis around the world.